Yeah, yeah, you already know. Thurston Howard III, the Polo Rican, the Skillionaire, the Skillosopher. Make sure you catch me on that Bootleg Kev show, man. It's going to be serious, man. What up, Bootleg Kev? Bootleg Kev Podcast, man. We got a special guest in here. Thurston Howard III, welcome. Yeah, what's up, Kev? What's, what's up, up? man? It's crazy because I remember uh, I told you like one of my first vinyls I ever got was one of your singles when you were with Rockus, and um, I didn't really know much about you. And then it was uh, through the source or the double XL. Mm -hmm. um, I really like I read up on you and uh, I was like super intrigued by the whole low life shit and um, some of the for people who don't know like what the low lives were like. First of all, you're still poloed out right on brand. It's life. Um, low is life. <laughs> but back in the 90s, correct me if I'm wrong, like you guys would like kind of boost a lot of polo, right? It started in the 80s. 80s, okay, okay. 80s. So in the 80s it started. Mm -hmm. What was, what kind of, give me the background of what the low life movement was. And, you know, I feel like we see so much of this uh, boosting of high end products out of like Louis Vuitton these days. And I'm like, you guys were doing it first, low key. So, I mean, you know, low life was just a group of kids coming together, man, for survival. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, did a lot of things we weren't supposed to be doing. You know, it definitely it expanded way beyond clothing and stealing clothes. There were so many entities to what low life was, but you know, we were known mainly for running up in stores and taking everything Russian. There was a lot of casual boosters. You know, we was terrorizing clubs and concerts and events and even the subway system but like i always stress in every interview because these are always the first questions yeah. low life has transformed since then of course we are a positive movement we are a positive organization within hip-hop culture pushing things forward and teaching people to actually do the opposite of what, what y'all were did. doing yep yeah. So, cause so many people just want to hear the crime. Listen, that was so long ago, and we've been on this path for a very long time now. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? We're heavy in entertainment, heavy in art, heavy in film. You know, heavy in community service and things like that. So, it's for me, it's really all about what we are today. I mean. If you want to know the low life history is all over the place on the internet, you could Google it and they'll tell you all the stuff that I'm tired of repeating because we, you know, we got the stigma stuck on us right. that I've been trying to shake off. It's been years since. Had they ever approached you guys to do like a show or like a, a, a movie? Because I feel like it'd be a great Netflix series like that 80s. Like, I just feel like that that was such a... Uh, uh, interesting thing to be a part of that like I, I'm surprised like, I'm surprised we haven't seen it kind of you know come out as like you know we see Raising Cane and we see Snowfall which is kind of based mm -hmm. on Freeway Rick Ross's life loosely you know what I mean has, has anybody ever approached you guys to do something like that well that's actually why I'm here in California right now um, we're doing the low life series the stealing the American dream with uh, Kevin Garnett and Content Cartel and my good friend Mark Levin and Blowback Productions so along with my company, Skillionaire, Dope. you know, so it's everything is, is in the mix. So it's just a matter of time before it's on the big screen. So, so that's on the way. It's on the way. KG's, KG's uh, what is he, a producer, investor? Uh, he's everything. Yeah. You know, he's part of the entire thing. We partnered up, you know, our companies to do this together in right. sync. So KG had a lot of interest in the story. You know, his company hit me up. We sat down. You know, Adam Sandler got involved. Oh shit! Happy Madison. So there was, there was, you know, there was so many angles to it, but it's coming. How would you rate Adam Sandler's drip? His drip? I mean, Adam don't gotta care, man. He I, that's he what do. I like about him, right? Yeah. It's just Believe very it much like it. His lack of is the drip. It says more than you know. If he were to be wearing like a. And it complements his personality and 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 what he's known for in comedy. It's like. I'm going to make you laugh every time I right. walk in the room, whether I'm telling a joke or not. Right, 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 right. You know? And he's a good dude, man, you know? Um, do, how much, first of all, how extensive is your collection of polo? Because, mm. you know, there's people who I know who have stuff that they've just, 
I got a good friend who collects the teddy bears, the actual teddy bears, mm -hmm. and I mean, he's got tons of stuff from when he was a kid all the way to now. Give me his address. <laughs> <laughs> but um, but like yeah, for you, like what would you say like these days? Like how much how, like how much stuff do you have at, at, at the crib? Like are you are you still collecting a lot? I mean. It's never ending. Right. But I don't hold on to things like people think. You know what I mean? I You're not love, a hoarder. Yeah. Not, not because, only because I like, you curse on here, right? Yeah. This is a, I don't yeah. say what the fuck. Yeah. I like my shit new and crispy and right. I like the up to date shit. Right. So many people want the vintage. They want to act like they was there in the past, you know? I don't care about the vintage shit. I was there. In the same manner as hip hop, like I feel funny wearing a Kango and Gazelle today. It feels like a costume right. because I did it in the 80s and stuff. Right. So I don't try to revisit the past in my time. I, I'm trying to, not trying, but I'm always into the new shit that's coming out, the fresh flavors, right. you know. But um, my collection is what it is, but I'm mostly into the home stuff. Like imagine if this is my home. All this shit is polo now. Right. So that's how I get down. That, you that's got the, the polo stuff. home stuff. You got the, the towels and the accessories yeah. around the crib. And That's the shit I care about the most. You know what I mean? Do you have any of the actual like stuffed teddy bears? I have the collection. Yeah. I have, I maybe have 50 bears. Wow. Man. And everything was like gifts, man, for right. my family, for my children. Fans probably bringing you stuff? Fans would mail shit to my P.O. box all the time. I've always put my information on like my CDs and mm -hmm. stuff, and here comes a, a box of, a, that I didn't expect. You know, I, a fan sent me an autographed Mike Tyson glove because they know I love Mike Tyson and I'm from Brownsville. Crazy. You know, so I just received stuff from people I didn't even know, and they would tell me, yo, I, I think you would like this. It's crazy because like, I remember... Like really hearing about Brownsville, like from MOP, right? Mm -hmm. MOP was like still one of my favorite rap groups of all time. Shout out to them. They the kings to me of Brownsville, as far as in the hip hop music. You know, they were the most dominant because they were the most consistent. Mm -hmm. You know, outside of myself, but MOP had more of a mainstream platform, and they had them bangers. Well, I just remember like reading their interviews and like in my head thinking Brownsville was like the worst place in America. <laughs> like how crazy was Brownsville in the nineties? Cause it had to have been like, I read some stuff that like, like uh, fame and Billy Dan's would be saying about like things that they used to do. And it just, it seemed like a very, and then when you would hear other people from Brooklyn talk about Brownsville, the way they would talk about Brownsville was like, it was, it was like crazy. Like, you know, Brooklyn is considered one of the worst, worst boroughs of, of New York city. And, the rest of Brooklyn don't come to Brownsville like that. Right, you know that's what, what it that's feels how like. Serious, and Brownsville is mostly composed of housing projects, mm -hmm. man. Maybe I think like 33 housing projects. And we're not talking about, you know, in all these other states, your housing projects are like two floors. Right. Two, in New York City, them shits is 20 floors, and you got 20 floors with 10 buildings per right. project and a bunch of, you know, Wow, people in each, you know, because it's poverty. There's a lot of poverty. So poverty stacked on top of poverty. So it forces people to be the way they are in that environment because mm. they don't have anything. So, and, you know, it's always about taking it. It's the Brooklyn way. So not just taking it out there to survive. They're taking it from each other, mm -hmm. you know. But Brownsville is it's massive, man. Like, I would have to credit Brownsville for everything I am today. Mm. Without that, I wouldn't be Thurston Howell. Right. If I would have grew up somewhere else, I wouldn't have been Thurston Howell. I wouldn't have had that Brownsville training experience, you know, because to, to be solidified in Brownsville takes a lot of work, you know, coming up. So I love Brownsville. Yeah. I was going to say, uh, back then, like, compared to now, that like Brooklyn has changed so much. Not Brownsville. I was going to say, but there is like <laughs> one area that really hasn't gotten a hit. Because if you think of like Bushwick and like all these areas of Brooklyn that you go to now, and it's obviously gentrified a lot, you mm -hmm. know, like a lot of people who can't afford to live and work in Manhattan, they go to Brooklyn or even mm -hmm. Harlem. Harlem's yep. definitely changing a lot. You know what I mean? Harlem's gentrified. 100%. Yeah. I was going to say for you, like, is it a good or a bad thing to kind of see Brooklyn kind of transform a bit and become more of a gentrified place because it is raising the mm -hmm. housing prices. It's making it a lot harder for a lot of people to live, you know? 
It's evolution, man. Right. We can't stop evolution no matter what, what we want or what we feel. But, you know, the sad part is that, you know, they force out the less fortunate or mm -hmm. the people who don't really have the means. Right. And, you know, they just making way for people from West Bubblefuck to come in and, and just take over these neighborhoods where, you know, as far as the older people that have been there their entire lives in their 70s and 80s that really don't have another place, they it's too late for them to relocate anywhere. That That's the only sad part right. about it. But the like, evolution, what is their option, really, yeah, you know? and they leave. They don't give a fuck. They, you know, they leave a lot of people with no options. But evolution, you know, when shit changes, you have to know how to change with it. I always say, evolve or dissolve. Mm -hmm. But you know, and but financially, being from places like that, a lot of people don't have the education. They don't have the opportunities the rest of the world have because they also blocked. You know, a lot of jobs will block you based off of your your zip code. Mm. When you get that's you, crazy, you fill out an application, you give them a Brownsville zip code, they looking that shit up. Wow, you know what I mean? But people still make it out of there and make it in there, you know, while they live in there. Right. So it's not a hopeless place. It's actually rich, you know what I mean? Because I grew up in Brownsville in a projects, right? And I look at my son who grew up in a suburb in a in, in a home someplace right. in a and um and. When my son comes outside, he didn't have a single friend to play with. Mm -hmm. But when I came outside in my less fortunate home in Brownsville, dysfunctional household, poverty-stricken neighborhood, I had a thousand friends yeah. when I walked out right. my door. So the riches I received from being there, like that's the part people don't understand. Right. Your personality is molded. You, you, you're around all these different personalities and characters that you're able to absorb and learn from mm -hmm. and mimic and... That's the riches of it, man. And everybody is so rich in talent, bravery, right. you know, resourceful. Because when you lack, that's when you have to be resourceful. And everything that was lacked, even within my life, I learned to be more resourceful. Right. I was going to say, uh, you were a part of like this golden age of underground hip hop, I call it. It's like the Rockus era, right? Because mm -hmm. you obviously were with Rockus for a sec. Um, I, I only did a single with Rockus. But I mean, I'm saying for a, for a quick sec. Yeah. But like, I just think of that whole era of New York underground rap, right? Because when we think of the term underground or backpack, it's really like mm -hmm. to me that pocket of like, you know, there was LA shit going on, like Dilated mm -hmm. Peoples and like uh, Project Bloat stuff like that. And then there was like in New York, there was most. There was yourself. There was R.A. the Rugged Man. There mm -hmm. was all. There was just this whole movement going on. Like for you, like. Being a part of that movement and like, cause nowadays, like, I don't know if there's necessarily an underground anymore. Cause I think the internet kind of just made everything so easily accessible to everybody. So there's just a bunch of niches, but like, mm -hmm. did y'all kind of realize like you guys are a part of this like really cool moment in hip hop history that I don't think has really been replicated in terms of just like that underground New York hip hop. Same thing about mm -hmm. the sound bombings and the tunnel and all this yeah. shit that was going on. I mean, I had no clue that that's what it was going to be or what it actually was. All I knew is, um, you know, that movement represented the people that weren't allowed to be mainstream or had to follow the certain standards of commercial radio or what your label is and your A&Rs right. are telling you. This was the real raw artists, you know what I mean? The hungry motherfuckers that was just being resourceful however they can. But I little did I know that it would turn into what it is today. Little did I know that I would even make it this far right. as an artist. You know, I could never have predicted that it would have been this. But, you know, the underground shit, the backpack shit, it still exists because there's certain cities like L.A., like Massachusetts, like New York, mm -hmm. where the underground still thrives heavy. I just like, mean in terms of like the newer artists. Like, I think that there's, like, still, obviously, like, I think the closest thing we have to that is kind of like what we've seen with, like, guys like 38 Special and Griselda and kind of mm -hmm. what they've been able to do in terms of, like, still selling vinyl. and But it's still more accessible. Like, mm -hmm. Benny the Butcher's doing records with 2 chains. Yeah. I think we back in the day to think that, like, Talib and Jay-Z could do a song together was so mm -hmm. far-fetched because yeah. it felt like they were so far apart, even though they were never that far apart. Mm -hmm. But like from a fan's perspective, the commercial shit and the 
underground shit were so far apart, even though mm-hmm. they weren't really. You know what I mean? Like, but but there was kind of like a segregation, kind of. Kind of, because a lot of people, especially in the mainstream, they looked down on the underground like it wasn't the thorough dudes or the street dudes. Well, right. I'm a street dude, so right. I was doing underground music. It just was, we were creative beyond anything, right. and some of the street dudes don't want to do that. Right. So that's what's separated. But I always said this as well, like when they were saying hip hop was dead, the underground was the life support right. keeping it alive for a long time. For sure, time. for sure. We was the motherfucking heartbeat of 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 hip hop, you know, making sure that the, it was pure as far as the culture is concerned. Um, did you ever attend uh, the Lyricist Lounge stuff back in the day? Of course, that's where I got started. What was that like? Because I I just re- I, I I remember I bought the Lyricist Lounge uh, double disc that came in the cardboard mm-hmm. sleeve, and then there was the one that had the uh, Oh No on it, which I think was two or three. Mm-hmm. But then there was the TV show, which was way ahead of its time, right? It was super ahead of its time because I think about how big Wild and Out is. That was mm-hmm. kind of like, kind of the first inclination of that. But Lyricist Lounge originally was like, was it a monthly event or how often were they doing Lyricist Lounges in New, in it, New York? It varied, man. It could have been every week. What every was that month? like though? And like, what were the other MCs that you know you were brushing shoulders with at Lyricist Lounge? It was full of hungry MCs that when you showed up, you got to rhyme. Mm. Everybody's rhyming. Fuck the stage. We could be outside. The cipher will go on all night outside. Right. It goes on in the bathroom. That's where niggas went to really sharpen their shit and see what you was, you know. I met Danny Castro from the Lyricist Lounge at an ASCAP um, event where they were playing demos and they played my demo. And I remember when one of my songs came out, you know, the crowd went crazy yeah. in a fucking listening party. So he approached me to perform. I've never performed on stage ever in my life. Wow. So when Danny invited me, that was the first show I ever did. I went to a Lyricist Lounge showcase. I performed along with Master Fool. Wow. You know, and, and shut it down. For my first show ever, that fucking that shit appeared in like 20, 30 magazines, the photo that said what happened that night. But I also was a part of the TV show. When we were recording the Lyricist Lounge album... Uh, we would get into ciphers even in the studio, attacking each other in rhyme form. And that's how they got the idea for the TV show, because we carried our conversations that way. And it was like, hey, that shit is genius. You right. know? It was myself, uh, Wordsworth, who's, Wordsworth a, who's a beast a with beast, it. A beast, yeah. Uh, AL Skills mm-hmm. was involved. So just the way we were interacting and they were filming, they got the ideas for the show. And then, you know, the rest was history. Yeah, that show, man, I feel like maybe five, seven years too early. Because I think, like, man, Lyricist Lounge would have went crazy in, like, 2012 or something, 2010. Like, I just feel like, because I, I, I watch Wild and Out, and I'm like, Wild and Out's really like a, like a, like, it's really mm-hmm. like a battling show. Yeah. Like, you know, it's mixed with comedy, it's mixed yeah. with, like, but it's, like, really, like, it's kind of dope, because it's kind of the rawest form of, like, punchlines. Mm-hmm. The Lyricist Lounge show was theatrical. Super there, theatrical. There was a Skits, lot of makeup lot of, involved, yeah, costumes, sure. and that's what I love. Hey, don't be surprised if you see another version it of was kind, it. Yeah, the Lyricist Lounge is the show for people who never saw it. It was kind of like if you mix Dave Chappelle and Wild and Out together. Yep. yep. Chappelle show and Wild and Out together. You know what's crazy? Um, Some of our writers on the Lyricist Lounge show were actually the writers from In Living Color. Oh, wow. That we had behind the scenes, man, so... And it, it was tremendous fun doing that show because same thing. We go fucking film, write all day. And then we, you know, we rented houses and lived together. Right. When we get back home, motherfuckers is going at it all mm. night, rhyming, like attacking, you know, right. just ciphers. So it was a beautiful time, man. You were super close with uh, Juice, right? Jay Weiss. I just went to see Juice yesterday. I didn't even know he was in Cali, man. What's crazy is... When I first got Napster, when the Napster wave happened, mm-hmm. so my best friend's brothers and dilated peoples. Wow. So when I was a kid, I was around them a lot, um, like Raka and Evidence and those guys. Um, but I saw Supernatural open up one of their shows, and it fucking blew my mind. Mm-hmm. It's the craziest shit I ever saw as a 12-year-old kid watching Supernat yeah. spin around and turn into Busta Rhymes and take people's IDs. and yeah. Fucking insane. But I remember like one of the first things I downloaded, I downloaded the Big L Jay-Z 7-Minute Freestyle on Napster, and then I downloaded the um, 
Juice Supernatural Battle, whatever one I downloaded on Napster. Mm -hmm. But then I discovered Juice and I was like, damn, this dude is fucking mean. Like, it's crazy that there's like this pocket of like MCs that in the grand scheme of like where we consider like the greatest, right? Mm -hmm. Just for whatever reason, don't get their flowers. Like Juice is one of those guys. Well, those those flowers are coming, man, because we all united right now. True, supernatural, me, and um, we got a lot of things planned, man. So it's like I always seen MCs like that with those level of skill sets, right? As forever, they're the lifers, you know. Yeah, maybe they don't have the promotions or the label deals, but they skill set. You know, keeps them relevant forever. Like I just brought Super Nat out recent, recently to do a show in Orlando. Mm -hmm. Orlando never seen anything like that. If you've yeah. never seen him before and you see him, you're just like never seen anything yeah. like that. I'm sure we, and that's what I try to incorporate in like the functions and the shows mm -hmm. we do. We bring out not the popular month, the skilled, most skilled motherfuckers you can imagine. And then it could also just entertain you at a show. Like this is tr the f if you are watching Super Nat do what he does, you are dialed in live. You're just like, what is happening? This is insane. And it's crazy because they both my friends, right? They both people that I would stay at their house. They would come to my house. We rhyme forever, and and then they battle, right? So everybody always asks me who's better, who, didn't. and I'm like, listen, they both of them are the greatest I've ever seen. You know what I mean? I think the one I had, it felt like Juice won the battle that I had on CD. Everybody has a different, yeah. um, you know, perception and of it. And that's what, because I didn't download that battle for Juice. I just mm -hmm. down, I just searched up Supernatural Freestyle and hit download. And I was like, who's this other guy? This is crazy. Right. Like, Well, my job is to have them together. So you see how dangerous they are alone? Imagine together. Um. Give me, because obviously you were a part of the, the Rap Olympics, right? Yep. Which were, for people who don't know, very pivotal to uh, a lot of people's careers. But, I mean, specifically, we always hear, you know, Eminem is synonymous with the Rap Olympics and his kind of a part of his story. Um, and you were a part of his team when you did the Rap Olympics, right? Mm -hmm. Who'd you guys go against? Was it, I mean. Uh, I believe it was Project Blow. Out of L.A.? Uh, yep, I believe they were the only ones that showed up. There was a long roster of teams that were supposed to be there from like every popular rap group that was out. Fuji's was supposed to have a team. There was, you know, different representatives. Different from, crews, yep, yeah. yeah. And nobody showed up. Everybody wow. on my team was a master in freestyling off the head. Right. You know, Juice, Eminem, myself, Wordsworth, Quest the Mad Lad. Like, right. sit in the room with us and you will fucking get blown. Even Craig G was out there hanging out with us, wow. like, staying with us and things like that. So, but it, it was a big moment, man. I was going to say, like, for you, like, I just remember Eminem being a real backpack rapper, I guess, back then. If you knew about him, you knew mm -hmm. about him. But he was definitively... Like an underground guy. Like he was on Sound Bombing too. He did mm -hmm. the Any Man record. He obviously bad bad versus evil with him and um or bad meets evil or with Royce. him and, and Royce. And he was definitely like, um, you know, shit. I wouldn't say no different, but like there was guys like him, classified. There was guys like in that kind of like, you know, the white boy rapper who could spit like crazy. Mm -hmm. And then it was just like a switch got flipped. And it's the Dr. Dre switch, of mm -hmm. course. But like how crazy was that for you to kind of see a peer just go from like, hey, I'm battling with this dude in the cypher and he's doing the MTV VMAs and he's an absolute superstar. And it's not like Eminem was like Eminem was like a lyrical rapper. Yeah. yeah. Like he was like Super a lyrical, lyrical, miracle, spiritual yeah. dude. So like, you know, if you heard his records... Prior to him getting with Dre, you would never think like he was even capable of making crossover records. No, I always believed it because. But his talent levels were so crazy. Yeah, what was that a, like? Being around M Man is like I knew he was destined. Mm. I knew because his talent blew everyone away. You know, we had a big mutual respect for what we both were able to do. Now, 
I knew at any moment something was going to happen. For me. And he was really the actual factual truth. You know, I always, me, when, when, when I credit anyone or anybody in the industry, I base everything off skills first. You know what I mean? Most and important. That's how, yeah, that's how it should For me, it's skills first. Right. I don't care about nothing else. He had the skills Top to, tier. to take it there. You know what I mean? Sure. So, but, you know, I was around several artists and I seen them blow up. You know, I seen Mos and Quali. I seen their shit. You know, as far as my peers are concerned, I seen them take off. I seen them take off. I seen so many of us. And it, all it did was give me hope. Mm. It, it showed me that it's possible to see the level that M got it to. I'm like, I'm next. I'm coming. And even to this day where I've never I've never had a situation. I've never had a record deal. I've never had any of that. But I always knew as I, if I stay in it to win it and I stay consistent, my day is going to eventually come. And that's everybody's thing. As long as you put in the work, you will eventually reach that motherfucking status. That way. Even if I had to do it myself, and mm -hmm. which I did. But this is not even the end. This I feel like this is not even the beginning. Well, you got a new album uh, with a hope, like a, uh, I'm sorry, Fill me in on the producer's name. It's, it's Mateo good. Getz, my dude, Mateo Getz. He's handling all the all the album, the whole production. He did, he did the entire production. You know, Mateo Getz is from Framingham, Massachusetts. He been my close friend for you know since he was a teenager. You right. know, I would hang out with him in the studio. Him, the entire Havoc house from out there. You know, I met him through my other good friend Jackson. So you know, we just Mateo Getz was like. Besides myself, man, he's probably the most dedicated person to hip hop I ever met. Mm. Where nothing else matters but hip hop, and him pursuing hip hop and being a producer and living his life according right. to hip hop. So, I mean, he came into a situation where financial situation where he's like, "Yo, we can do us, we can make an album right now, push it." And he gave me a call. And we decided to work on an entire album. I've never done an entire album with anyone besides myself being the producer producing the entire album. Right. You know, but like I said, he was my brother. I was happy to do it. We were already working for years besides that. He's always produced something on my projects. We've always hung out. We've always just been <laughs> friends if that's all we had. Right. You know? But he produced this whole album. He definitely crushed it, all the beats, you know. I actually got everything that I wanted. You know, we, we worked it slowly because I always wanted to make sure I had the right material. But at the end of the day, we had that polished, you know, finished product that was I was definitely, like, proud of. All right, you already know, man. We got to stop the interview. Shout out to my bookie right now. If you go to my bookie and sign up, man. I was just playing roulette, like, live with a real person spinning the ball on webcam at the casino mybookie.ag you can uh, of course bet on baseball but really you got to get down with the casino they got the slots they got all the card games blackjack craps uh roulette table games galore it's a full-fledged casino mybookie.ag and when you sign up with that promo code bootleg sign up right now use that promo code bootleg they're gonna get you hooked up with a first deposit bonus mybookie.ag let's get back to the interview now if you guys don't know about king pong king pong is all natural, baby. Yes. All right. We're talking about the leader when it comes to uh, tobacco-free, natural, organic leaf wraps. If you're a smoker, a toter, a straight West Coaster, you know what I'm saying? Whatever you're into, King Palms, they got it for you. What's great about um, these, these are like one of the best uh, products that they sell. Now, this is a, a terpene-infused tobacco-free leaf and what's dope is you stuff your flour into it and then you press on the thingy, you know what I'm saying? And then you got flavor. I'm gonna show you what it looks like when it's stuffed with some great tree from Hardeen, of course. Ah, look at that, right? Get that thing stuffed up. The tip has got that flavor in it. Uh, wherever you're at, man, make sure you check out the, uh, um, you know, they got the smoke shops, they got those on lock, they got 7-Elevens on lock. We only smoking out of King Palms, baby. You already know what it is. And if you go to kingpalms.com, kingpalm.com, kingpalm.com, and you use the promo code bootlegkev, you will save 50% off at checkout, half off at checkout, 
50% off if you go to kingpalm.com and use that promo code. The promo code is down below. Go run it up. Try some of these flavors too, man. The peach pineapple, the strawberry shortcake. They just got so much going on. There's also all kinds of dope smoking accessories you can get half off, y'all. What are we talking about? Save 50% off. Kingpalm.com, promo code below. It's either bootleg or bootleg calf. I'm, these promo codes got my head hurt. Try both of them, all right? One of them will get you 50% off, goddammit. Anyway, let's get back to the interview. I was going to say for you to be a part of so many eras, right, where people will buy vinyl, people buy a CD, and now we got this streaming era of music, TikTok era of music. It's a lot more different. Mm -hmm. Is it harder to uh, keep adjusting when it's like it feels like everyone's attention span is getting shorter and shorter? Or I mean, you have a built-in fan base like that's going to support like no matter what. But how are you evolving with just the business that's evolving at, from day to day? You know, evolve or dissolve. Yeah. Like I said, I I make sure I stay in tune. Right. Um, I'm not a trend follower. Right. But I will follow what's needed to push what I'm doing. Right. You know, I might not be into certain things or actually even enjoy them, but I know if they're necessary, yes, I'm going to apply along with them and do and evolve as time's evolving. I'm not changing my style for nobody and right. shit like that when it I comes to music. I mean, I don't think, I think it would be crazy for you to do that because your fans, they expect... They, they expect shit. that crazy shit, right. you know what I mean? But I'm also... I, in my in my opinion, I'm one of the most versatile artists ever mm -hmm. because I switch so many different lanes. You know, I go from Spanish, Spanglish, reggae. I do fucking nasty shit like Two right. Live Crew. Mm -hmm. I do extremely creative. I do massive punchline songs. So, you know, you can't really box me as an artist. I can do the commercial shit all day long and I could give you the rawest hip hop you could imagine. Yo, I'm not tripping. You had a record on... Did you have a record on one of the Grand Theft Autos? Nah. No. Yeah. Okay, maybe I'm tripping. You know what? Maybe I'm confused because you were on Game for a little bit, right? Yeah. I did a single with Game, the Polo Rican. That was Shout my out single to game. on Game. Game had, I remember they had, uh, they had some shit. They had the Royce shit. I yeah, they had the Aguilar, the cook, cook, Crookie Monster. They had the Blase mm -hmm. single. Shout out John Schechter, too, I man. I say shout out Shecky Green, man. Shecky Green is a, is, he's a, that, he's uh, a wild store, guy. There was that dope store in Vegas, hiphopsite.com. Mm hmm which was a fucking sick ass store. Shout out to Pizzo. And, Pizzo is the man. Uh, I yep. did a lot of stuff with Pizzo, man. I never even met him personally. Really? You know what I mean, just super nice guy. Yeah. Yeah, but I just remember like uh, when I was a kid, I, I, when I went to Vegas, my parents were like, "What do you want to do?" I was like, "There's a store if you could take." Wow. Me. Yeah. How old are you, man? Thirty six. Oh wow, that's what's up. My kids are older than you, man. Yeah, I went and bought a big L. Uh, <laughs> I went and bought a big L T-shirt from that uh, store, hiphopsite.com. Damn. I even did promos for them, like um, you know, songs and right. commercials to advertise the site, man. But Pizzo was a good dude, man. Like we did a lot of stuff together, you know, as far as pushing my mm -hmm. albums and things like that. They definitely supported me. I was gonna say. As you being like the OG guy who could go boost a whole store rack, right, from a Dillard's or from wherever, when you see, like, what's happening, because it's really, listen, it's everywhere, but California, they're making it really- Oh, they're getting busy. They're getting busy out here. Getting like, busy. they won't even stop you. The cops ain't even going to arrest you. Like, it is kind of like, just from your perspective, do you, like, look back and be like, damn, like, if we was out in Cali in 89, we'd be eating. Nah, we even got caught because we ain't had no cars back then. So we had the subway system. So in you guys New York. would grab racks and straight run to the subway. Straight to the subway and hit the tracks. Not wait for the train. Wow. You gotta hit the tracks and run. And now you in danger. You could trip. You got rats. You got bums. You got work bums. You got homeless people living down there. Like So you hit the tracks and you're hoping to get to the next. Nah, you're not hoping. You're getting You got to get there. Motherfucking right. We making it to there. Anybody ever not make it? Many times. Like, um, you know, a lot of rushes and stuff like that, it, it wouldn't just be one store. That shit would continue the entire day, whether you just casually boost in or whatever. So along the routes, people get caught all day long, but it never stops anyone from going to the next spot. Shit, even McDonald's was hit. Like, you know. I was gonna say, like, how many people at once would go in? It would vary. Like, it could be five sometimes, and sometimes it could be 50. Mm -hmm. It depends on where we at and who's together. Cause you, we could just randomly be meeting up at a movie theater or something, and then a bunch of people show up out of nowhere, and then 
the talks start happening, the ideas thrown in the air, and right. motherfuckers are marching to stores after that. Crazy. And then I remember, because I, I think of the artists who really embrace polo, obviously, you, you, I think of you, um, and I saw you say that uh, Ray Kwan was kind of like an honorary lowhead, right? I mean, we, you know, we respect the whole Wu, man, and Ray Kwan is... Like I said, we consider him one of us because he did it in the same style and fashion and all that. I, was, I even have Ray in my book, in the Bury Me with the Lawn. Yeah. He has he has a segment in my book where he speaks of all of that. I mean, he literally, like, I can't even, I don't know if Tommy Hilfiger would have been, like, Tommy Hilfiger, I really think, when I think of Tommy Hilfiger, I think of, of Ray Kwan. Like, you know, I think, like, it's just crazy because, like, Back then, were you kind of like, were you like the polo plug for a lot of artists? Like if they needed some shit, would they just hit you? Nah, nah, never. I was the one you scared to wear your polo around. You know, it was So you different. were the guy like, don't wear it around me because I might take that shit off you if I ain't oh, seen that piece no nah, more. Nah, I was part of them dudes that taking it off your back. You know, mm. let me get that. That's What size is that? I was one of them dudes. How, because we always, it's funny because we hear about that era and it was, it felt like a 90s thing. Where if you had Jordans on or you had some gear on, yo, run me the, the fit. I like that. I feel like that doesn't happen as much, right? Like right now it's more like, yo, give me your watch. <laughs> give me the jewelry. You know what yeah. I'm saying? Give me your French bulldog. <laughs> but back then it was also that. Like it was everything. It wasn't just the clothing. It's like, give me a chain. Give me, give me your girl. Wow. Because low life is so fly. When we coming through, your girl's watching. Right. And possibly we gonna take her too. She's gonna to wanna to come with us. There's so many times when we're running deep, we had so many stragglers just follow us. And I mean women, right. people we don't know because they would know what we were going to do. Mm -hmm. And they would add on to the chaos and just jump in the mix out of nowhere. And that happened a lot. So at times you might be on the subway, fly dude. You don't even gotta be fly, it could be a crackhead. Crackheads oh. like in Times Square would hey, jump hey, in. What you got on? I like those. Yeah. Run me that. Shout yeah. out. Hey, fucking, obviously years later, Annie Up comes out, right? Which kind of like on a commercial level mm -hmm. communicates to the rest of the world mm -hmm. that you will get robbed for everything you have if you come to the Brownsville. Mm -hmm. <laughs> How important, like Annie Up is like the commercial, like obviously MOP had Four Alarm Blaze. They had... Um, What's the out the, their first album? I can't think of the name of their first album. I have it on CD. Um, hardcore. Hardcore. How about some hardcore? Yeah. How about some hardcore? But like Annie Up was like a commercial, worldwide, mm -hmm. Brownsville anthem. Yeah. Like it really kind of like to me was like this is like this is what we're about in Brownsville. Mm -hmm. Don't come over here and get caught slipping. You know, for us too, even myself, I wasn't somebody robbing my people in Brownsville. We mm. took that shit every place else. You know what I mean? If anything, we protected. A lot of people in Brownsville protect where they live right. and the people around them. But they also rob each other. Right, right, right. But right, that's right. how you become built to withstand it. Because once you go through it a couple of times and you learn how to hold it down and defend yourself, then you able to make that cease. That's how you earn your respect. Mm -hmm. And then from that point on, people know not to bother you, not to bother your family, because you're doing what you're supposed yeah. to do as far as survival. But you know our motto in Brownsville, man. Never ran, never will. I was going to say, uh, you've obviously had some experiences with Hove, who's another Brooklyn legend. What was your experiences coming up and, and being around Jay-Z? I mean, Jay's the GOAT to me. You know? I agree. He, I, he's done it I, I all. I think he's the GOAT. Yeah, he's the GOAT. He deserves all the accolades at this point, and I salute him properly. But, you know, I've even always followed his music, you know. I admired his skills, his style, everything about it. The evolution. Yep, yep. Mm -hmm. And everything he's become right now, I, I stand proud to say that's Brooklyn, baby. Um, Ho was actually one of the people interested in doing the low life story, like, most, you know, the sit downs we have had were based around doing this film or this series or whatever it's supposed to be. But I mean, all my interactions with him were mostly me trying to battle him, like trying to pull him out to battle me and things like that. So I got to a point one day where instead of asking him, I just spit at him. So he had to respond. And, you know, I could tell this story forever because, you know, being who he is, mm -hmm. 
Not many people could say they actually would step to Jay and attempt to battle, you know, because I'm a monster with it. My punchlines are the truth and all of that. But do you recall which year that happened? Uh, 96. Wow. So that's like reasonable doubt. Like. Reasonable doubt era when he had Rockefeller offices like mm -hmm. downtown. So I, one day I was demo shopping. So when I made my first demo, I had my first five songs from a mm -hmm. four track, you know, had a bio with a with a headshot. And I probably had 50 packages in my truck that day. And I went to Def Jam. I put one on everybody's desk. Right. I went to the source. I spit for the unsigned hype. Mm -hmm. They gave me the column. Yep. And then I went to Rockefeller. And with the day I went there to just to take my, my package, Jay-Z was actually in the office. And they called him out to mm. come see me. So I'm like, he knew who I was and right. all that. Because I also worked at MTV for years and... Most of the artists that would come to MTV to do whatever work, I would step to them to battle. And that's where I used to approach Jay most of the time. I even approached him at the Video Music Awards one time. Crazy. Yeah, like, what's up? We're going to battle? What's up? You know, I would do that constantly anytime I seen him. That's so crazy to think. Well, how did, first of all, how did that go when he, he spit back? Oh, nah. He would always be like, you're not ready for So me. you rapped, yeah. you spit at him. Not those times. Only the last time was I didn't ask him because every other time he just brushed me off right. and he's not trying to hear me. So I guess he didn't know what I possessed. So mm. that last time... He found out. Yeah. So he had to spit back because my rhyme also was something that was kind of... Particular to Going him. against everything he says, you know, that it was against the drug rap, the mm -hmm. my Rolex and Lexus in Texas. Right. I don't want to hear that either. Yeah. You know, I was on it like that, but he definitely came back strong. You know, he definitely spit. He rode the elevator with me down, and we was on there getting busy. Do you uh, do you remember any of your rhyme? From that um, from that elevator ride, the rhymes you were about to hear, nevertheless, of my own. This is for you young MCs, oh my, how you've grown. You got bigger, better, stronger, and much faster. I remember when you were smaller, slower, with a speech imped impediment and had asthma. You a comedian when you started doing stand-up, and when you come up with all these fucking stupid answers, your rhymes would be cute if you wrote them on a pad that was pink. When MCs think they're above the rim, I make them realize they're really below the sink. Before we battle, check it out. I got these rules. You can't say nine times spine. All that shit is preschool. You could talk about coke deliveries that would never be here. But shit like that. Wow. <laughs> but I, I'm, I'm bugging that I actually remember that right. shit right now. Because it was crazy. also an acapella that I put on that... Brooklyn Hard Rock single. It had one acapella to go with it. And that was the acapella that I spit at Jay that day. Jesus. That's crazy, man. Shout out to Ho. So we, sh we will be seeing the Low Life Story in some form or fashion. On you will be seeing it screen. on many forms. Mm. Because my, my you know, aspect and my part of the story is only one camera angle. Right. There's so many stories. There's so many low lives that there's so many different stories involved. In. So the story you're gonna see is just from my perspective, but I'm sure there will be other perspectives coming into play. At a point in time, how? Because I think like I always hear about the hip hop police back then. Obviously, late '80s, '90s, heavy mafia times in New York City. Uh, that's kind of like the peak of like when the mafia kind of started to end, I guess, was the early 90s. Were you guys like looked at as like a criminal organization at of, a certain point in time by course. the NYPD? Of course. So it was like, in the books. One of, one of my good friends worked at a, a youth incarcerated center, right? And he sent me a card one time. He sent me a photo of a card that when you come into the juvenile system, you had to fill out this card and it asked you which gang are you a part of? And low life was one of the boxes of the options Crazy. to check off, man. Who would actually fill that out honestly? Like let's just admit to being in a gang on this a, a juvenile youth wants it to be known. Mm. He wants that credits because when he walks into that, he wants people to know his gang affiliation with pride. Mm. And you know, I know that from being a dumb juvenile youth as well. So it's crazy, man. Well, I can't wait to see 
whatever comes out of of the meeting. Many that you were things in LA. are coming out. Uh, the mm-hmm. out al- is the album already out? Did it come? Yeah, out? Thought yeah. Skill Illustrated is on all digital platforms. I got features on there. Me and Smooth the Hustler got a joint called Brownsville Legends. I got the Rock Nest Monster and UG from Cellar Dwellers. We got mm-hmm. a song called Lows and Cons, basically telling the low life and Decepticon relationship mm-hmm. because everybody always thought like we was against each other or, you know, we was ops, but that wasn't... In Brownsville, that wasn't the case. Maybe in other areas, because in Brownsville, we was all family, lowlifes and Decepticons. We actually lived in the same neighborhood. What are the Decepticons? You know, there was a bunch of dudes on the train beating people up with hammers, man. Like the fucking home tool hammers and and robbing everybody for Walkmans. But they would be on the subway system like hundreds of motherfuckers coming through. That's like what you always hear like... Cause when you, cause like I never lived in New York. I think the first time I went to New York was 2013, and you hear about this crazy crime wave that was happening, and then you hear that Giuliani cleaned it up. I guess cleaned it up. And did it? Was it like a thing when he became mayor? You really noticed cha- shit. The change was, yo, know, unexplainable. You know, he imposed the quality of life law. And remember, in New York City, you get on the subway with your liquor bottle, your beer bottle. Giuliani stopped that. That helped because niggas was on the train drunk, wilding. You know, there was all kind of shit going on in New York City, but he definitely cleaned it up. I believe it's back to being the dirty New York it once was. Even Times Square that got cleaned up, you know, the oh, deuce. I was just in Times Square a little while ago. It was, and it was wild. Now it's back to the do- the dirty deuce days. You know what I mean? There's all kind of scammers Boot- out bootleggers there. Bootleggers is out. Bootleggers. The three-car Marley dude is back. Oh, my God. The, the, the dude t- with the t- little t- ball. The caps? Oh, yeah, the God. cap dude. Yo, when I seen that, recently Bro. I seen that. I'm like, the deuce is back. I was in South by Southwest, and I did not know about this. You ain't know my... (laughs) And so we're in front of this liquor store in like 2014, 15, some shit. And I'm watching this dude, and I don't realize that the guy I'm watching win is is with them, you know? Mm -hmm. And I'm like, oh, this is is easy. Easy though. Those motherfuckers are magicians. Nah, it's also a scam. There's always a dude there betting that they're allowing to win, and you think you could win, and as soon as you place the bet, you I lost. always just tell everybody, if you're out and you see a guy with a little plate, and he's got three soda caps and a little ball of paper, don't play the game. You will fucking lose. When I was about- And it's never- And if you're going to play, it's never the one you think it is. Pick any of the other two that you don't think it is. No, they make you think it's one. They do something, right? When I was a little kid, around 10- I used to live with my uncle on 106th Street in um, 116th Street in Spanish Harlem by Lexington Avenue, and I remember outside of my building the three car Molly dude used yeah. to be there every day. And one day I'm watching him. I'm only ten, and and I noticed that the card that was the red card was kind of bent. Mm. So I'm thinking as a ten year old kid, yo, this guy don't realize that it's bent. That's the one. And I remember telling my aunt, yo, he don't know his car is bent. You know, let, give me $20 let me to play. And, yeah. money. and she was like, no, nah, that's what they do. So they actually bend the card and leave it bent for a while. And as soon as you place the bet, they bend a different one. So you're going to pick the wrong one every time. Dude, so they have got uh, those guys with that those three caps and that little ball. They took me for like $700 of South wow. by Southwest. Damn. I was hot. I was like. There's no way. This is, I was just. 700. These guys were so, man, it was just, yeah. And I just saw, I was like, it's like the casino. Like these guys, there's there's something about the flick of the wrist or it's like, they're magicians. Like literally they're kind of, you know, magicians are really good. It's a magic trick. Yeah. It's a sleight of hand shit. It's kind of wild. Yeah. Nah. So you think New York is getting back to how it was when it was just terrible? Because you keep hearing that the crime is. Is grown as exponentially since the pandemic. Obviously, uh, is Eric Adams the new mayor? Yeah. Who who is supposed to be more hip hop? The hip hop mayor. Well, I heard De Blasio kind of just had shit fucked up, you know. Yeah. Uh, but well, yo, I think during the pandemic, the crime rate increased increased at two hundred percent. That's what they was advertising. Two hundred percent. Shit was out of control. I mean, if you could survive that shit and move out and go someplace else, you dominate anywhere you go. Because New York is a fucking animal, man. If you could survive there. 
If you could survive there, like true. like uh, it's true. Who said it? Uh, old blue eyes. It's said, true. If you could make it there, you could make it anywhere. I believe if you could make it there, you could conquer anywhere because the mentality and aggression you get from being trained and raised in New York, especially if you ride in that subway every day, packed, crowded, million personalities Crazy. from all different ethnic groups and shit like that. Yo, you get that's that's the best training you could ever have. Did you guys ever um, back then? Because, like I said, that's like peak mafia. Towards the end of the peak mafia, did you ever have any run-ins with? I mean, Brownsville and the, obviously was not a mafia area, but obviously just being in New York, would you ever have run-ins with any of those guys? Or because that was, I mean, I've I've just been doing such deep dives recently on YouTube with a lot of the the New York shit, and uh, it, I, I'm like, damn, like they really. Had their hands in so much construction, and I mean, Michael Francesi was like mm -hmm. had the gas thing going, and there was just it almost felt like if you were kind of a part of the underworld in some capacity, like you had to have rubbed shoulders with with that lifestyle a little bit, even if it was in, inadvertently. Yeah, we did, man. In 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 several different instances in life, you know. Um, uh, for one, I would ride my bike through like Howard Beach and Ozone Park from Brownsville like going to Far Rockaway right. I, and I've been chased through those neighborhoods like you know on bike by a bunch of dudes this mafia area they, mm -hmm. they try to run you over on the highway you know just to prevent you from coming through here even Michael Griffin man who who actually got killed in Howard Beach and was a friend of mine Wow, you know so there were many situations man that dealt with them I also worked with um uh, uh, a coalition that would, you know, I, I guess they call it scapescaping, like construction sites for jobs and things mm -hmm. like that, where where when it was time to go to these construction sites, these were the mob dudes. So you got a bunch of black dudes coming to try to get jobs from the mob dudes. And and it was uh, Arkbar from Brownsville where he had the company at the spot called Operation Future, which is also the law school. Mm -hmm. And I believe his life was threatened. And, you know, they was attempting to kill him and all that. Because they you had know? so much to do with, like, the labor force and, like, yep. the unions and, like, the construction companies in general, like, who's getting contracts. And for many years, maybe since the 20s and 30s, that, right. that was existing. It really ended in the nine, like early yeah. 90s. Mm -hmm. So, it's, it's, yeah, I just always wondered, like, damn, like, how crazy would it have been to just, like, be in New York? during those times like uh yep. last question give me the most legendary or intense cypher but they don't have to be the same cypher they could be different cyphers that you've ever been a part of wow damn that's that's i can't even i've been in a million cyphers well, wait, wait, with a bunch of monsters man so everybody was like massive you know even ciphering with m like you know me and m would cipher or m would come to brownsville Eminem would come to Brownsville. Eminem would come to Brownsville at 2, 3 in the morning. Really? Paul Rosenberg come to Brownsville to my project. Really? And we rhyme. Even Paul Rosenberg would rhyme. That's wow. how, that's how like inspiring our, me and M's like rhyme session was that other people would jump in. Because we only freestyle. We didn't really spit no written shit or nothing like that. So Eminem was coming to Brownsville. Now this is, this can't be... It's in the nineties, like ninety seven, ninety eight. So this is when he this is right right around the time like you know, he was doing like the wake up show and like doing this. Before all of that. Before all the yep. oh, before wow. we started hitting because once we were introduced, then we became friends and you know, we stayed involved with each other. And even Paul became my lawyer at mm -hmm. the time, you know. So Eminem comes to Brownsville at two or three in the morning. Anybody give him any hell? Like, who's this nah, fucking white man. boy for walking over here at 2 in the morning? Let's if you come into my house, ain't nobody bothering you. Wow. I know everybody here. So it's like, and it's, there's a lot of love there. It ain't as crazy as everybody thinks because the people love each other right. and they protect the area. So if you're coming in there, With the right, they know you're yeah. going to see someone. They make sure you're all right. You know? Damn, Eminem at Brownsville, 2 in the morning. Jesus. Facts. And rhyming his ass off all night, man. It's like, couldn't stop. Wow. Anybody ever get so offended in a cipher you were a part of? Not say it was from you that 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 violence ensued. I don't think they wanted violence, but I was always disrespectful. You see, like some of these battles where somebody will say something yeah. and then they they'll get slapped. 
I mean, you say my mother or my kids or whatever. Right. I mean, nigga, you might get stabbed out of this <laughs> motherfucker. That's why in, in today's, you know, world of battle, I can't do that. Because I'm, I'm not... It gets very disrespectful. Yeah, nah, I'm not with it. Like, I'm disrespectful. And I know it's being a battle, but right. I've never touched your mother's subjects or it's, and it's, your kids I feel or like your a lot girl. Of, and like, not to say that... I don't want to blanket the battle, because I'm not as in tune with the battle world as, as most people are that are into that. But I think it's less about the cleverness of the bar and more about the level of disrespect. Sometimes it feels that way because those are bars, right? A punchline is just a joke. Exactly, that's to belittle you. Mm -hmm. So the more disrespect you, you, you disrespectful you are, the more you belittle in the motherfucker. My whole thing was to belittle you and disrespect you. I even made people battle me. Like, like if you, you would... famous, you're not walking by me. I'm standing in front of you like I'm going to rob you, and we're going to battle. Okay, besides Jay Z, give me an example of somebody that we would. Know that you did that with where you made them have to. Well, one person I battled, um, you know, like I said, I worked at MTV, so of course, so everybody's I, walking in and out, yeah, in and out. So I worked at uh, I think it was like 95, or I worked at Fashionably Loud, um, it was like a big fashion show, mm -hmm. it was almost as big as the VMAs, okay, to where um, we're working at, at the Hammerstein Ballroom, and um. They, I, you know, I'm the guy on the walkie. They say, hey, uh, we got so-and-so walking in. Or right. Somebody take him up. So it's like, hey, Coolio's coming in, and uh, he needs to come up in the elevator. And I'm like, shh, I got it. Shh, shh, copy. <laughs> so now I get I, now I get in. The, Coolio comes in with an entourage, right? Yeah. Rest in peace, Coolio, Rest man. Rest in peace. My respect for him for sure. after that day, whew, through the roof. Um, Get on the elevator. Close it up. You know, we on a freight elevator. He got about four or five dudes with him. You know, I'm a big dude, too. So I'm standing there. What's up, Coolio? You want to battle? And then everybody looked and said, what? Even even the dudes he was with, like, yo, this is West Coast, man. So yeah. I'm like, cool. But yo, Coolio just started spitting. And I knew he had skills beyond the, the records, the commercial right. hits yeah. he had because I did buy his albums, the WC and the Mad Circle. Sure. You know, when I was in prison, I used to buy everybody's stuff through the mail. And so he automatically got busy and we went at it for a little while. And, you know, it was it was respect, you know, respectful. We didn't it was no disrespect, but he showed me that he was a real MC and he was really about this hip hop shit. Yeah. And ever since that day, whenever I spoke of Coolio, because most people in New York City, they weren't familiar with WC and the Mad Circle, right. so they only knew Coolio from the Gangsta's the, Paradise, yep, and, the big hits yeah. and all that. So when I spoke about him any time in New York City, I let them know Coolio is a real hip hop dude, MC, all and official. You know what I mean? And God rest his soul. I mean, Coolio was one of the most famous rappers on the planet yeah. for about three years straight. Mm -hmm. Like, I mean. As a kid, you would just he'd be on Nickelodeon, he'd be on MTV. I mean, he was there. You couldn't go nowhere without seeing Coolio. Yeah. Nah, Coolio was about it, man. But I've also I stepped to everybody, man. I stepped to Rock Him working at MTV. All right, listen, I'm on vacation. We're cutting commercials live from Mexico. We're on the beach, damn it. So check this out, man. Don't forget, it's summertime. You got to go to Blue Chew, BlueChew.com. Promo code Bootleg. All right. That's gonna get you a free month supply. Same active ingredient as Viagra and Cialis. Of course, uh, the best part about Blue Chew is it gets your dick super hard. What are we talking about? All right, if you're dealing with erectile dysfunction due to stress, due to, I don't know, whatever is going on, mentally it happens too. You can get that ED fixed. Blue Chew, promo code bootleg. Free month supply, bluechew.com. Also wanna shout out to the family. At Odd Socks, baby, that's right. Shout out to Odd Socks. They got all kind of crazy new licenses they just dropped. Uh, man, Transformers. They got the Hasbro licenses now. Power Ranger socks. Of course, they just did the Coca-Cola earlier this year. Of course, the most comfortable socks in the world. Go to oddsocksofficial.com. Use that promo code bootleg and save 20% off oddsocksofficial.com. And I remember he was coming in the MTV building and I'm like, yo, Rob, what's up? You want to battle? So he was like, what? And we went to the side, right? And then I spit my balls. And, and he was like, yeah, that's nice. That's nice. So he didn't take it as a battle. 
He just told me my shit was good and all that, you know. And I wasn't, you know, this is the God. I'm not being disrespectful in no right. form. But my approach, remember, I'm I'm a I'm a true New York hip hop culture dude. So I'm a break dancer who battled the whole Brownsville. I went to the Roxy's just to battle. Like I never danced. Only dance I ever did was a break dance. Yeah. So and I only went to the clubs in those days to battle. That's you know, so, so crazy to just think like you're in the elevator. Hey, what's up, Coolio? You want to battle? Did that? Did you ever get yelled at by MTV for trying to battle everybody? Nah, because <laughs> I, I did it very discreetly. And you like if my producer right here was like, "Hey, what's up, Thurston? Nice to meet you. Do you want to battle?" I'd be uh, like, "What are you doing? You're embarrassing." No, me. I never did it. I never did it in front of you know, bro. The that's people legendary who was in charge shit, of shit. That's so. Funny. Nah, I told you, I was just on a, another show this weekend. They asked me about my Buster battle because me and Buster went at it. Uh, one night at the tunnel, I probably told this story 50 times. I'm at a red light. Buster pulls up beside me. And you know, shout out Buster because, you know, he just got the big award, yep, lifetime yep. achievement. For sure. And I only tell the story because he deserves everything he has right now, who he is, and also because he's still that dude that's going to get at you when it's time to mm -hmm. flex your shit, right? So I'm at a red light. Buster pulls up beside me. You know, we're at the Tunnel Nightclub where you circle the block looking for parking. I guess they doing the same. So when he pulled up beside me, he's in the passenger seat. I'm in the driver's seat of my truck. And I looked at him and said, Buster, you want to battle, nigga? And nigga looked at me and said, what? I said, pull over, nigga. He said, no. And he started spitting. <laughs> and went at it, yo. He was going so hard that the light turned green and everything. Now we got traffic backed up. All the horns are hung. You guys are battling through the car windows. Through the car window. Then we pulled over and went at it for like an hour. You and Buster Rhymes. Me and Buster. I didn't even have a demo at Outside the, time. the tunnel? Outside the tunnel nightclub in New York City, like on 11th Avenue. What year, if you had to guess, was this? It was right when he began to promote the Woo Ha single. It hasn't dropped so yet. First album, Buster. This is first, first single before the album. scenario remix. Yep. yep. Buzzing. Yep. yep. So this is that Buster. But like I said, man, he he got busy. So Crazy. these are the people that really live that shit. That's why it's nothing for them. They don't feel disrespected because he's also built that way. That's mm -hmm. what he comes from. I say the same about Coolio. Yeah. And there, there was a lot of rappers that when, you know, because it got to the point, I would go to the tunnel every week. And I stopped going inside. I'm sitting outside with Just my truck. Who walks up. Everybody who walked up, I'm stepping to him. I remember Pudgy the Fat Bastard walked up one day. You know, I'm like, you know you got to do this with me right now, Pudgy. We got to get this in. And we moved off to the side. You know, we rapped back and forth. But, you know, he was focused on getting up in the club, you know. but how, there was, how crazy was the tunnel? Oh, man. You had to be a thug to go up in there or a pretty lady. Because, you know... I w I've been going to the tunnel since the 80s. The 80s was popping with the tunnel, In my too. head, I just think of people in, like, like puffy goose jackets, Timberlands, and, you know, fucking Scullies. <laughs> yeah, some of that. But whatever the trends were at that time, a yeah. lot of jewelry, gold yeah. chains, you know. And, and the thing was, it was full of, like, all the thugs from all the different projects and neighborhoods. Right. With from the all up, the borough. Would the stick-up kids wait outside of the tunnel? Hell Yeah. Matter of fact, like a couple of blocks away, there's a project mm -hmm. near there. Those dudes were eating. Yeah, because a lot, not everybody had a car. There's New York City. So right. you would have to drive. I mean, you would take the train and maybe walk the five or six blocks through their area. And they knew that that was, these motherfuckers was robbing dudes all the time. You know, Damn. but there was also dudes that circled the block waiting for you to come out. Like your Friday night, Saturday night. That night. was a Sunday night or at the tunnel. Yeah, Sundays Sunday at nights oh, at the tunnel. Shit. That's crazy. Shout out to the tunnel. I just the only thing I know about the tunnel is it was a hell of a Funk Flex and Big Cap album. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Shout out, rest in peace to Big Cap. Rest in peace, Cap. Well, well listen, I appreciate you, man. Uh, the new album's out right now. Thought Skill Illustrated, all digital platforms. Like I said, check the website, ThurstonHowardTheThird.com. Check my YouTube page. Watch all my movies, all my videos. I'm on IG. Facebook, Thurston Howard the Third on everything. You know what I mean? And uh, hopefully we get the story of the low lives and soon. Hope is here, baby. It's coming. Hope is here. Hope is alive. So. I can't wait to see it. Yeah, nah. Uh, who would you uh, cast to play yourself? 
Uh, I got a couple of people in mind. I don't want to say it yet. So that way I don't put them on point. So where they're trying to figure out how much to hit me in the head yeah. for. Okay. You know what I mean? But I, I got some good ones. You know, we've been pursuing this story for over 20 years, like myself and Mark Levin from mm -hmm. Blowback Productions. And in the beginning, in the early 2000s, I had chosen Rick Gonzalez to play me. You know, and Fire. he was the perfect. He would have been per perfect. Yeah. Would, the only problem is now is that you know he's he's older, and this and is he, uh, this is a young role. Decent you know? rapper, from what I recall. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Rick is busy, yeah. man, and I, he would have been. He, he to me, he's still perfect, but the role is for it begins as Someone a sixteen-year-old kid. Yeah, I feel like you need somebody kind of like relatively unknown. And that's exactly what you we're want, gunning you want for. This role to change their. Yep. career trajectory. That, that's exactly how we're thinking, man. Yeah. We want to give somebody that opportunity. Like Damson Idris, like in Snowfall. Like nobody, yep. like now that dude is the hottest. And that show put him mm -hmm. in place, you know. The, the Wire. The Wire. The Wire. How many actors from The Wire can we say? But Idris is the one that actually it, it yeah, put Idris him on the map. No, Idris Elba. No, yep. no, no. I'm saying Damson Idris is a different guy than Idris Elba. Okay. Uh, Damson Idris is the young kid from the UK that played Franklin Saint in Snowfall. Oh, oh, now, that's what's Idris Elba, Elba, The Wire, Stringer Bell changed his life. The Y is, is and gangster. Michael K. Williams' life, yep, and yep. so many actors. I mean, I can. I mean, geez, well, my we, favorite show ever. That's what we hoping to do, man. We want to break ground. I want. I want a Puerto Rican actor to play me. I want you to guys give could that low key be like the that era of New York's version of The Wire because it needs that. That's where we going with it, baby. Because it's so many stories so within many, the story. Yeah, there's so many different, you know. There's so many moving parts in it, yeah. and there's so many sides. So you know, it's gonna go to so many different angles, man. Like even what we have prepared already is like, wow, right. you know. Well, shit, I can't wait to see it, man. We appreciate you coming through. You already know. The third, go uh, support. What's the website one more time? ThurstonHowardTheThird.com. Shout out all the low life family all over the world. You know what I mean? The ULL, the RLPC, the Orlando Low Zone, the Miami family, Low Life Mexico, Low Life Paris, Low Life Australia. Wait, can I ask you one more thing yeah. regarding Polo? Okay. I obviously was hip to you guys, but I didn't start buying Polo until I was 16 and I got a part-time job at Macy's and I was having my mom come in. And I would only ring her up for like one out of 10 items. I was stealing for sure. Mm -hmm. um, and the reason why I wanted to start wearing polo was because of Kanye. Wow. Because I was a huge Ye fan. How, how, for you guys to be like the OG polo guys and to see Kanye put polo on, on a commercial level, like a whole nother level. Like when he came out, he was polo the fuck mm -hmm. out. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. How did you guys feel about that? And like, how did you guys kind of, because he got a lot of credit for the polo. Mm -hmm. Putting polo on in hip hop, even yeah. though you guys were, yeah, we were the we pioneers. Were, yeah. I mean, some low lifes were offended. Mm -hmm. I even think they took shots at them and things like that. But I saw it for what exactly it was. Um, he was just opening the doors for us. You know, yeah, he got it. But then when he did it, it really focused on us and our backstory. I think in hip hop. I'm the first one to really exploit the polo on the cover, mm -hmm. even before Kanye came out. You know, For sure. the Brooklyn Hard Rock, and then my out my first album, The Skillionaire, showed like all the polo coming out of my mm -hmm. closet, vomiting type right, of right, stuff. Right, right. So, you know, but me personally, man, I'm I'm never mad at anything because I know where I stand, right. I know where I sit, and I know where I'm going with it. And all those little things actually help us, like. Including the um, 50 Cent show, the Raising Caning. Yeah. They have a low life character within the show. Mm -hmm. And so many people were upset and saying this and that. Oh, they said, I'm like, yo, they, they making it easier for us now, you know, to push our show or to pitch it because they're showing that and this was, exists. And it was important, yeah. And I credit 50, and I got to say thank you, 50, you know. Did Kanye ever reach out to you or shout you guys out at all? Uh, I mean, I think he responded to one of the things oh, that was, did. yeah, like, I, you know, he had that song where he said, oh, you're trying to say I'm not a low head. Yep, yep, yep. And I'm, that was, I believe, in response to what other low lives were saying. But, you know, much success to Kanye, which he already attained and much respect to him, man. Because he I keep saying ground. last question. What's the most ex expensive polo item that you've either. The one I wear every day. No, but you had to have had that. Like, is there like a fucking polo 
you know, Rolls Royce or something. I don't know. Like, what is the, what's the craziest polo item you've ever owned? I mean, I, I would say the stuff that I create myself. Like, if it's something Ralph doesn't make, I would take things apart and create my own. Mm. Like, you know how we would do the silks. We would get right. three different giant silks and make it, into a, and it into a shirt that yeah. doesn't exist on his market. And they would actually sell for thousands. Like, I... The value in the shirt is really after I take it off. Yep. Now this shirt is valuable. Yep. So now I could sell that motherfucker for whatever. That's crazy, man. Well, I appreciate you coming through. Thursday nah, thanks for having me, yes, man. Sir. I'll be back many times, man. I will be out here in Cali a lot. You know, working I had to on, rock working on a smash. Working TV on show, everything. Movie, whatever. It's way know? more than music. It's way more than TV. You know, I'm a multimedia man. So there, there it is. Every angle, man, I'm trying to cover, man. Well, appreciate you and pulling it's, up. It's the culture, yes, man. Yes, sir. I'm for the culture all, all right. the way. Hey, appreciate y'all watching another interview brought to you by our good folks at Hardeen. Now, listen, y'all, when you're in Las Vegas, you get in that fucking Uber, you land at the airport, hit that taxi, tell them to take you to Hardeen, the number one premium cannabis dispensary in the fucking world, y'all. I'm telling you, you walk in, they treat you like a king or a queen or whatever you're into, all right? They got the craziest selection of premium cannabis you'll see, period, anywhere, let alone in Las Vegas, but just anywhere, all right? Not only can you go get the best tree, you will get the best experience, the best customer service, the best bud tenders. You walk into Hardeen and that shit just smells amazing. They got their own fucking scent. Literally, you get into my car, I got a bottle of it. I, my car smells like Hardeen because it's just the best fucking place. Um, go follow them online. Hardeen underscore Las Vegas. Hardeen underscore Las Vegas. Go to their website, HardeenLasVegas.com. All right, when you go, you're in Vegas, you pull up, tell them I sent you, they're going to take care of you the right way, all right? Look, they got these things in there, man, these moon rock uh, pre-rolls that I just had that just absolutely melted my face off. Shout out to Hardeen, all right? You got to go fuck with Hardeen, man. Hardeen underscore Las Vegas. Uh, thank y'all, man. I love these guys. They're like family to us. And uh, hey, we're going to drop another interview soon. If you're watching this, you're at the end of the interview, though. Much love.